Hi, and welcome to Axel Bank Reports, History and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. I'm Evan Axelbank, and today we're going to speak with Robert Strauss, the author of John Marshall, The Final Founder. He's been a reporter for the New York Times and Sports Illustrated. He also teaches at Penn. Thanks so much for being here, Robert. Thanks for letting me be here. Before we start our interview, I do want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We're going to donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, John Marshall, Robert Strauss argues in his book that our fourth Supreme Court justice, who served from 1801 until his death in 1835, deserves to be on that very short list of three. So you've got a founding father who provided the the ideological justification for revolution, the other who organized the first army and glued the country together politically, and finally, the founder who made the court system worthwhile. We're used to today's Supreme Court rulings coming down as final decisions. The country respects them. But in those early days, the Supreme Court was quite literally in the basement. So, Robert, where was the first Supreme Court located, and how was that symbolic of what the political system and the country itself thought of as the nation's highest court? Well, at first it was actually in Philadelphia, and it, and they it's in the side of the Independence Hall, and you see the rickety chairs. But so it was it was a rather respected place. But when the Capitol moved to Washington. Uh, the uh, uh, Congress gave it a uh, a nice basement room in the Capitol, uh, which was on many Saturdays uh, the, a place where there were dances were held, and on many Sundays church services were held. So uh, it, it, it was a definitely secondary or tertiary, if we're counting three points of the uh, three three uh, major branches of the government. As you say in your introduction, your goal with this book is not to write a cradle-to-grave treatment of Marshall, but rather to use Marshall's life to explore how we explore American history. Why is he the perfect figure to do that? Well, he is, um, he is uh, for those of us, for those people who know uh, Woody Allen, he was sort of the zealot of the founding fathers, and those who are a little more modern. He might be the Forrest Gump of the founders, although Forrest Gump was not not exactly. Uh, 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 well, he was a, he was a pleasant creature, uh, but but in any case, he was everywhere. Uh, Marshall uh, Marshall was uh, there at the pretty much the inception. He was a soldier in the Revol- Revolutionary War, and he died in 1835. So that's a long span of um, as people would call it service to our country. And he was in the, he was in Congress. He was in the Pennsylvania, Leg- excuse me, Virginia legislature. He was, he was a, a, a diplomat in France. He, uh, uh, he was a, a secretary of state and he was for the longest time, the uh, chief justice of the Supreme court. He was born in 1755, which you argue was the perfect time to be witness to the growth the birth and growth of the United States. It made him 21 when the declaration was written, 34 when Washington took office in 1789, and 46 when he became chief justice. What are some of the things that he was a firsthand close witness to that made him, as you put it, this Zelig character? Well, he, you know, he, his father was friends with Washington when they were young. Uh, They were surveyors. And uh, you know, being a surveyor isn't exactly like the guy uh, with the with the drop thing, uh, making sure your uh, the the lawn between your neighbor and you is the is at the right angle. These were guys who were looking for land for a client, and uh, many many of their uh, uh, payments were in land, which was uh, valuable is sort of the wrong word, but but it was something that that people wanted in, in the early part of the United States. Uh, these were the types of people who were, were uh, adventurers. I mean, just think about coming to the United States. I mean, think about, you know, if those people who have seen Hamilton. He came to the United States. 
he became a figure, right? I mean, Hamilton is is, is certainly the, the type of figure uh, that, that uh, uh, deserves a musical. Um, uh, and, and, you know, something on, a, uh, on uh, money. Um, so Marshall came out of that little uh, uh, area of Western, it's not even Western Virginia, it's just west of Washington, really. But in those days, 40, 60 miles was, was a long way to go. Um, uh, and when the, when the war started, he uh, became a lieutenant. How did he become a lieutenant? Well, because he said he was. Uh, he had a bunch, of, a bunch of his little friend followers. His father taught him how to shoot a gun and, and, and wear military regalia. And they went off together to uh, fight with Washington, his friend. He fought in a little bit of New Jersey. You know, he had some experience and, he was, and his service was done. So he starts coming back. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm extending the story a little bit, but, but this is how you get started. My, my, my contention is that, uh, you know, I looked at recently at the uh, early censuses, 1790, 1800, 1810, and realized that it wasn't that hard to be a founder because at, in 1790, so that's like a little bit later, uh, there were 800,000 white men over 16 in the United States. That's not a lot. When's that Baltimore? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and of them, some were 16 and over. So, you know, that cuts that down. So say 750,000 or something like this. And so if you had a, a lot of Americans wanted to be out in the country. And, and, and then some were in cities where there were, uh, there were other things. I mean, they were, you know, uh, uh, pot makers or, or, or whatever they were. Shoemakers. Uh, but yeah, shoemakers, anything, yeah, anything, right? Uh, so, um, so Marshall, uh, uh, like decided to be a soldier and he comes, uh, comes back to Virginia and he, he, he soon becomes a, 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 a solid citizen. I, I can go into that, yeah, because it's a sort of funny story, yeah. No, we, we will, I, I want to hear it, but but one of the things the early part of your book wrestles with is this idea of knowing when the founding era ended. Now, right. I always thought of it as around, you know, 1797 when the first transfer of power happens from Washington to Adams. Washington makes it clear that a democracy must not rely on one person. To me, that was, you know, until I read your book, that was the moment where the country was a country, where it wasn't just going to be, uh, a, you know, a a country where one person held power until he felt like giving it up. And then he would give it to his son and then his son would have it and, and so on. That was the moment that our country was sort of, at least in my mind, was a fully formed um, nation for, for, you know, despite all of the shortcomings that are quite obvious, um, uh, hopefully. But to me, that was like, okay, the founding era has come to a close. Um, Washington made it clear democracy can't lo- rely on one person. Why do you challenge the notion that the founding era ended um, just 25 years after the Declaration of Independence, that it in fact ended much la- later than that. Okay, well, I mean, because of course I'm I'm uh, I'm relying on my guy Marshall. Right? <laughs> uh, well, you could certainly pick that time. You could you could see even certainly pick the uh, uh, ratification of the Constitution. Uh, part of part of the, you know part of my whole aspect of history is that history is fun and entertaining and and has all these other things going on in it. Uh, so one one way you could say it, it, it's that, um, you know, we're coming down, the, the, the Constitution says after nine uh, states ratify it, it's valid. Well, we're coming down uh, to the ninth state, and we haven't gotten Virginia or New York yet. We forget that back then, Virginia had 21% of the nation's people. It was the big place, Right. So good luck having a country without Virginia. You know what I mean? So uh, it really, you know, that, that could be the, uh, 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 the beginning of the country when Virginia decides we're going to go, we're going to put cast our lot with these people. And, and then New York follows suit soon after. And, you know, <clears throat> North Carolina and Rhode Island come later, but they're, uh, you know, they're like uh, the, uh, the guys at the end of the basketball game picking up the last points. But, um, 
so you could pick that. And I picked the I picked Marshall's ascension uh, to the uh, Supreme Court as the time when the country is really bound, because right after the time you say, it starts getting a little frayed with new parties and and uh, uh, you know Jefferson and his band coming in and and uh, other parts of the country trying to decide whether they'll secede. New England was trying to get New York and Aaron Burr to, you know, go up into another country. The South uh, was similarly following Virginia. Uh, and then they have these disputes that can't be resolved until the Supreme Court takes it upon itself to say, we're resolving all these disputes. And now we have a a, a legitimate uh, a country that that's different than other countries that, you know, the, the, the court just doesn't solve something, you know, a, a, a suit against your neighbor for, for bad fencing, it, you know, it resolves something that's a national import. So how does John Marshall start to get noticed by important people? We know he had military service. He eventually gets elected to the house of delegates. Um, how does he start to make a name for himself? Okay, so so uh, interestingly, Marshall went to one year of school. One year, when he was about 10, his father sent him to boarding school. Uh, but his, his father had books in his house, and, and this is how a lot of uh, our uh, founder, founders found their way, uh, Washington as well. Uh, anyway, so he comes back from uh, uh, war, and his father is in... Uh, is in Williamsburg and Yorktown, uh, that area of Virginia. And he's got some military sinecure, you know, over there. And so Marshall's nowhere to go and he goes there. Well, as he's coming there, there's this family with three teenage daughters and they decide, well, we haven't had a party. Let's have a party greeting the new military hero as he comes to Yorktown, the Amblin family. And so while they're, uh, planning this party, uh, the youngest daughter, uh, who is 13 years old, says, well, I'm, he's going to be mine, or, or whatever else it is. So Marshall comes to the door, and suddenly he's not Christopher Reeve in his Superman costume. He's a guy who's sort of gangly, and he's got a, a fringe jacket, much like uh, 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 Joe Buck in, uh, in Midnight Cowboy, and, and uh, sort of a military with what he views as a military hat and he's got boots on and he's uh, he, he's sort of quiet and shy and he's not the hero except the 13 year old girl still likes him and so she uh, you know during this party uh tries to woo him and he is smitten so he says i'm gonna stay here i'm gonna figure out what i'm gonna do to stay here meet you know i don't know hustle this girl. So uh, over at William and Mary College, there's uh, a guy, George Wythe, who, who is the primary uh, uh, teacher of the law in Virginia. Thomas Jefferson had gone to him, other people had gone to him. And so uh, Marshall starts attending his lectures. Meanwhile, at night, he's over talking poetry with uh, Polly Amblin. And part of what we have in Marshall's papers is his notes from that class with uh, with with and on it it's like it's a junior high girl it's like John M and Polly A you know like all the stuff Ms. Ms. Polly Amblin or something like that all these on the fringes so meanwhile her father gets a job in Richmond across the uh, across the state so they're going to go to Richmond and Marshall's thinking about this and he says, you know, I'm done here in William and Mary. So he attended about five weeks of law school. He gets uh, 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 a legal license from his second cousin, Thomas Jefferson, who happens to be governor of Virginia at the time. Good person Later to know. On. Yeah, good person to know, right? They all know each other, right? He gets to Richmond and soon after he becomes like the best lawyer in Richmond. Well, big deal. Richmond had 2,600 people. And that's what's funny also about our republic. We always look at it as the junior version of what we have now. Well, in that 1790 census, excuse me, the 1800 census, the one afterwards, there are only five places with more than 10,000 people. Five in 1800. 
There's Philadelphia and New York, which have about 40, 50,000 apiece. So they're like the real big cities. And then there's Charleston, Baltimore, and uh, Boston, which have like 10 to 15,000 people. Well, just think about Boston, how important Boston was. And it had 15,000 people, less than probably <laughs> three quarters probably of the town. Probably my neighborhood, yeah. Probably yeah, my right, neighborhood, right, yeah. Right, right, right exactly. Yeah. So, so um, it wasn't that hard to become, to get into the House of Delegates if you wanted to. <laughs> it, it, it move it along and, uh, you know, gets to Congress. He gets to Congress and, you know, he, he becomes a, 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 a macher, as we would say in, in, in my town, in my my people, my tribe, and uh, <laughs> things, things about him become myths. Like he was, he went to get inoculated for smallpox. Well, it was just the opposite. People, if you, it was, it, it's like a zoning violation. If you wanted to get inoculated for smallpox, you had to tell all your neighbors because they might be afraid of the inoculation spreading to them as the disease. So he apparently goes to Philadelphia and they say he walked to Philadelphia and he's all sort of gangly and, you know, bearded and he gets his inoculations and walks back. Well, maybe, but, but in any case, uh, um, uh, so that's the kind of thing that gets spread around about you. And, and then you become bigger, just like a movie star would it with, with his public relations people. Baking from our childhood just sticks in the memory, doesn't it? We never set off on holiday without piles of Tupperware. And there'd always be Bakewell Slice, Flapjacks and tray baked scones in the boot. Do you not do that, Lisa? No. (laughs) Sadly, I do not stack uh, the Tupperware in the back of the car when we go off on holiday. Welcome to Small Ways to Live Well, a new podcast from The Simple Things magazine. Season two is a pick-me-up tonic that helps us make the shift from winter to spring. A six-week suggestion box full of things to note, notice and enjoy about the season. Search for Small Ways to Live Well on your podcast app. Where do we start to see the roots of a potential jurist? What foreshadowing was there in his early life? Well... Because he wants to get involved in everything, you know, that's that's part of what being a jurist is in the higher levels, I think, maybe even the lower levels. But but the thing about the Supreme Court today, there's nine people in the Supreme Court, all but one of them, Amy Barrett, went to Harvard or Yale in either law school or uh, uh, undergraduate. Right. And she went to say, oh, Washington School, Notre Dame, you know, I think she went to some schlepper school in comparison Mm -hmm. to them. But but not re- not really. Anyway, so so and there they are with lifetime appointments. Well, think about who do they have to impress? Each other. That's about it, right? There's nobody that's going to knock them down. I mean, we have we're we're not likely to have an impeachment trial in the Supreme Court. I, I I don't think. So they're all there for life. I mean, you can't get Stephen Breyer out of his chair with a with a shoehorn, right? You know, as much as the Democrats want this, but but. Uh, um, you know, because so what a job, right? And uh, 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 so, so their their value usually is as as public intellectuals more than uh, a judge would be in the superior court or the higher courts of the states. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, Marshall viewed himself as somebody who knew everything. He would he would when he first got the why. Well, no, I mean he actually. He was actually the general contractor of Washington. So, you know, uh, uh, John Adams, one of the things that John Adams did famously then, and we don't view it now, he went, he went to, lived in Quincy, Massachusetts, almost as much as he lived in Philadelphia and Washington. There was one year he was there for seven months, seven months in Quincy. It's not like there's social media there. Social media is him writing a letter that gets on horseback and maybe gets to Philadelphia. You know, in, in yeah, a few in days. Two weeks, yeah. Yeah, right. So so he one of the things he leaves to um, Marshall is the uh, getting Washington together. You know, he says that uh, uh, I'm leaving, I'm going back to Quincy, it's hot, I don't like it here. You put it together. So he supervises the building of the Capitol and the uh, White House. There are other little buildings, but mostly those two. So you can say that Marshall was probably the first person to sleep in the White House because by the time it starts getting built, it's got to be better than one of the little hotels 
along the, the, the putrid stream between, <laughs> between the two buildings. Uh, so uh, uh, he's, he, he, he learns that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, he knows he, he was part of the XYZ affair, which is a complex thing, but basically the, 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 uh, the group of three uh, uh, guys, one of whom was uh, Marshall, uh, went to uh, France to try to negotiate a treaty and Talleyrand, the prime minister, you know, is only seeking bribes through these three other guys who come to him who were named X, Y, and Z in the uh, 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 private letters. And Marshall finally takes the lead and says, we're not, we're not giving you a cent, you know, and comes back and he comes back a hero. Even the, even the uh, uh, Anglophiles love him now because he hasn't, he hasn't given up anything to France, uh, and, and 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 so he he does become a bit of a hero. And and when uh, when uh, Adams finds that uh, uh, Hamilton is sort of controlling several of his cabinet members, he kicks those three out. One of them is Secretary of State, and he takes on uh, Marshall late in his term as Secretary of State. John Marshall to John Adams is a political tool. John Adams needed him to, I guess, help soothe the tensions either in his cabinet and in and or in the country. Um, talk about that a little bit more and, and how John Adams saw John Marshall as kind of this lever to bring two different sides together. Well, one of the things, one of the things that Marshall is, he's a Federalist from Virginia. So he gets, you know, he gets a little bit of the South uh, you know, at least through, such as it is, it, into his ken. And also he is uh, probably Washington's greatest acolyte. It was, you know, Washington was God to uh, Marshall, but Washington also liked Marshall, thought he was smart. Uh, 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 eventually Marshall gets Washington's papers and writes the first official biography, which is sort of bad. But <laughs> I mean, I don't mean bad, it, 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 evil, it's just, not very good, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. We won't, we anyway, won't tell him you said, we won't tell him you said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, but but you know, he he uh, he he's sort of a he, he he's become this intellectual, an intellectual who didn't go to college, who barely went to school, and yet he becomes uh, the heir in a certain sense to the Federalist Papers. Uh, uh, the the guy who is is thinking by this time. Uh, Hamilton and Madison and even John Jay, or some of them are, are all just politicians. They're they're vying for power, and uh, the the need for somebody to to leaven the the, uh, the republic is left to Marshall, and he loves it. He loves the idea. What had the Supreme Court done by the time Marshall took over as Chief Justice? And and also talk about the makeup of it. How many justices were there at this time? There were six. <laughs> Why they chose six? That it's just you know they they view the chief as not a part you know a person above. So you had five, but you needed to always have a quorum, and they didn't always get to Philadelphia or Washington. You know they, these guys are schlepping up from South Carolina. Well, they they don't quite make it for for the beginning of the term. So uh, what had they done? Had they done anything? The first uh, the first session of the Supreme Court had one case, and it was settled out of court. Uh, so John Jay was the first, and then John Jay becomes uh, a diplomat. They send him to Britain to to uh, supervise right. the peace treaty. Well, can you imagine this? Like John Roberts, you know, Biden calling him in and saying, "Hey, yeah, uh, John, like things aren't going too well in Jerusalem. You mind going over there and helping out?" You know. So, so, uh, uh, so that, and and then the third su Supreme Court. Chief Justice Oliver Ellsworth, the same thing. He's stuck in France uh, uh, negotiating a treaty about the pirates and he gets sick and he doesn't make the last boat in, but he gets to send a note and he says, you know, I guess I got to resign you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm here in France for the winter. So, so uh, it, 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 you know, uh, Marshall, who's now Secretary of State, comes in with Adams and and they're trying to decide who to make Supreme Court Chief Justice. And uh, uh, Marshall comes up with names, maybe Jay should come back or whatever. You know, Jay resigned because it was better to be governor of New York uh, than, than to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And uh, uh, anyway, so, so uh, uh, 
Marshall goes through his list and Adam says, no, I think it'll be you. So, so for a time, we had a guy who was Secretary of State and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, which, you know, we, we, we go back to the founders did this, the founders were pure, they had all this other stuff, and they weren't pure, they were just as political as anybody else. And this was, this was what was going to work for Adams, you know, this was what, what was, uh, uh, what he saw happening. And let's face it, there were not that many employees. I mean, uh, the, the, the federal government had 130 employees. You know, and some of them were secretary, that counts as secretary of state. I mean, you know, so. so right. There were probably 130, uh, there were probably 130 letter carriers within 10 miles of me right now. Right, right, right. And so, 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 you know, and the treasury department had most of the things because they had to collect taxes at various places. Right. So I, I, Marshall had like nine employees as a secretary of state. So, uh, which was mostly like chief of staff, uh, uh, would be today. But nonetheless, he was yeah. both. There. Nine is nine. Uh, what were the roots um, of, uh, so you have a Supreme Court that really hadn't been effectual and it didn't quite have the the the, uh, the respect of the nation yet. Um, let's talk about this critical case that he decides, that he writes the opinion for, and that sets much of judicial, you know, precedent for a long, long time till today. What were the roots of Marbury v. Madison? Uh, where okay. can we find, uh, where can we find the roots of his finding that the court system can evaluate whether a state or federal law jives with the Constitution? Well, it, it has a funny history, as many Supreme Court cases do. It's almost like the facts don't matter. It's what the principle that the justices can can make out of it. Because Marbury was sort of an operator. He, William Marbury was a guy who took little jobs in the government and made, that's where he made his money. He had, one of his jobs is he helped find the site of the Naval Building. You know, he was, anyway, so this thing, so, but he, he laid himself with the Federalists and the Federalists were gonna go out of power. The 1800 election changed everything. It changed uh, uh, the, the Congress and, and the president were Federalists. And now the Congress and the uh, um, uh, presidency were going to be Republicans. And by the way, you know how the people, like Democrats, hate when when uh, 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 one of the conservatives call it the Democrat Party instead of the Democratic Party. Well, Marshall was just like that. He would call the party the Democrats. You know, sometimes they were called Democrat Republicans, but mostly they were Republicans. And he would call them the Democrats because that would link them with the revolutionaries in France you know, somehow. So you know, the Black Lives Matter or the French Lives Matter or something like that. So, so you know, he, he was an operator himself. A anyway, so, so Marbury uh, doesn't get his commission. Well, why doesn't he get his commission? Because at, uh, at the very end of the Adams presidency, when it was decided in early February that, that uh, Jefferson had won, uh, um, they start uh, giving out uh, judicial type appointments. And one of them was Marbury's commission to be Justice of the Peace in Washington, D.C. Not even the Justice of the Peace, one of four. Washington only had like six, 7,000 people. How do they need so many Justice of the Peace? But nonetheless, this is what happens. And uh, as the clock is ticking, uh, uh, Marshall as Secretary of State is signing these commissions. Well, they don't all get delivered on time. And one of them is Marbury's. They were, and uh, Marbury sues. Now he's suing Madison because Madison is now the Secretary of State, but uh, Madison doesn't want to give him a commission. And in fact, they're, the Republicans are all pissed because they now there's all, you know, we complain of those liberals complain about uh, the, the Supreme Court being six to three conservative. Well, every, every court employee, not just justices and, and judges, but every court employee. At, at the stroke of midnight on March 4th, 1801, was a Federalist, you know? So Jefferson and his people are facing a complete Federalist bureaucracy in the courts. So they do their best to stop it. And they, and they, they, they come up with a judiciary uh, uh, law that says, that, that, that pushes the Supreme Court schedule back so they don't meet for 18 months, even though Marshall is ready with his decision on Marbury versus Madison. 
as the as the case is being tried, one of the one of the justices gets gout, and he's stuck in the hotel where all the other justices are staying. And uh, so Marshall does his uh, Mohammed to the mountain thing. He he takes the Supreme Court hearing to the lobby of the hotel where the judge judge could get down, have a quorum. They decide Marbury versus Madison based on a guy's gout, and of course, Marshall should have recused himself. He was the man who caused the whole problem with Marbury, right? But no. But anyway, he's got this convoluted ruling that, that I won't get into all the convolutions, but some in substance is it says that, the, that it, he, he always gives a stop to the other side. He says to Madison, you don't have, it's not your job to get Marbury's commission to him. They made the mistake of not doing it. It's, you, know, you don't want him, he's not in, right? But here's the thing, uh, the, the one thing that you can't do is have this happen again. And, uh, and part of the judiciary law that he invalidates uh, uh, changes the judicial system in this way, that he said just that he could do that. And it stuck with him. I mean, Jefferson hated him, but he, he felt that he couldn't, he couldn't go against the Supreme Court. What he would hope that would happen is there'd be very few times that there would be a reason to do this. But Marshall, in case upon case, over the years, McCullough versus Maryland, Fletcher versus Peck, there are all these cases. But basically, they say the Supreme Court can, uh, can rule on laws that are, uh, or, or rulings between states, between the state and federal government, between the federal government and, and people. And so that makes the Supreme Court a, uh, a valid operator. As you have said um, during this show and in your book, uh, this was a very tenuous time uh, when Madison, uh, I'm sorry, when Marshall takes uh, over as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The country was fraying politically. How did the Marshall Court provide a check on potential rebellion and to stop, how did it stop even further fraying from potentially being disastrous for the United States? Well, this, I mean, the, the idea that it could, uh, that somebody could bring a court case to the court and in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an important case, and in, in, like the earlier cases were just about sort of land use for a single person and that sort of thing. And they were important to the person and maybe the county or something. But, but the, this was, this was uh, sort of monumental that, that, uh, that uh, the, uh, it was just another person to answer to. Uh, uh, that that Jefferson, as much as he hated Marshall, uh, uh, had to say, well, you know, <laughs> we've got to go through him somehow. So we've got to figure out how to get our things done in a more peaceful way. I mean, there, you know, uh, there, some, uh, Hamilton, and if you read the book Hamilton, he was stoned on the street. You know, I mean, you know, we think about the insurrection I mean, here was the guy who was who was running the Treasury Department, and and people didn't like him in in certain parts of New York. I mean, he was at a rally, and that's just what happened. They started throwing stones at him. Uh, you know, he he and uh, he and uh, uh, Monroe almost had a duel. I mean, they were everybody was at everybody's throats, and and uh, it was up to a a sort of removed head like Marshall to do it. Uh, and he was a party giver. You know, that's the other thing is that most people sort of liked him. I mean, one of the anecdotes as he had is that uh, they're in the Supreme Court building and the, uh, 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 he, he tells one of his uh, associates to go look outside and see what the weather is. And the guy looks outside and it's sunny out. Well, uh, Marshall always had the, I said that, you know, he couldn't have a drink until it, it was raining. And uh, so when he says, oh, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, it's sunny. I says, well, it's raining somewhere. Bring out the Madeira. You know what I mean? So, so th this was this was a, you know, this was sort of a collegial type of thing. Now the Supreme Court didn't meet all that often, and when they did, they, he asked that they all stay in the same hotel, and he asked that all the decisions be, uh, well, they were. You never knew what the uh, finding was. Yeah, excuse me, the, the, the vote was, it was five to four, nine to oh, seven to one. He said, we speak as one voice. 
And once they did, spoke as one voice, no matter whether they were Republican or Federalist, uh, Marshall got them to, uh, to agree to this. What other opinions did he write that you find critical? And there's, well, maybe I should have said it this way. I want to talk about one particular opinion that I find okay, particularly good, good, good. interesting. Uh, there is um, an understanding that as a Floridian, I can travel to Georgia whenever I want. I can travel to Alabama or Mississippi whenever I want. I can get on a plane and go to New York whenever I want. Um, that's part of the benefit, part of the privilege of being an American. You can travel from state to state and you can do business within states. Um, I can mail a letter to another state. I can sell something to somebody in another state. Um, talk about um, this critical decision that he makes and how critical was this decision um, that he says you can do travel and you can do commerce between states and that states don't have a right to say, we love Montana, but we don't like Idaho. Well, you know, there's a couple of uh, uh, cases that, that that turn on that sort of principle. One is McCullough versus Maryland, another is Cohen's versus Virginia. In Cohen's versus Virginia, there was this, uh, the Cohen's, a Jewish family, and and in Virginia, they, they actually weren't allowed to hold office. But they, they had this case because they, they ran the lottery there. And, uh, 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 you know, part of the part of the tickets for the lottery were uh, uh, a national lottery, and and so the case revolved around whether they could sell tickets to the national lottery as well as the state lotteries, and uh, and, and and other you know other other kinds of things like that. I mean, it was it was like FanDuel, uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, so uh, he ruled that you know that, that not, nothing super nothing. They they may not uh, have a uh, you know the stop to the state was a, they may not just tag along with the uh, uh, national lottery you can't just sort of add our the, the Virginia part to it but you can sell two different lotteries that's just the way of doing business I mean it, 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 and, and that may that may not be exactly what you're talking about of going to state to state but in a sense it is uh, allowing uh, business in another state. To happen. By the way, the, the restriction on uh, 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 Jews uh, uh, went out in Maryland and, and uh, Virginia, and uh, uh, several of the Cohens became uh, office holders and judges in, in Maryland and Baltimore. So you know, so the so I, I guess they, they got enough publicity from this case <laughs> to uh, to move along. Progress. Uh, you have a chapter called. Um, and remember, this book really is not, as you put it, technically a biography. It's really an examination of why we look at history and how we look at history. You have a chapter called Marshall Was Almost President. So who else came close? Um, how did Marshall almost become president? What kind of president would he have been? Uh, and then who else came close? You mentioned Well, he was Henry almost a compromised candidate when the, uh, in the 1800 election where uh, Burr, uh, as the vice presidential candidate of the Democrat Republicans uh, didn't defer to uh, Jefferson in the amount of electoral votes uh, that that all changed later with a constitutional amendment that he had to do two different candidates. Anyway, as things were going along and the states kept on splitting the same way in the uh, Congress, uh, uh, th they thought of, well, what if we have a compromised candidate who will stay in until we can get to another election. And that might have been Marshall, but uh, this all got resolved by well, essentially bribing the congressman from Delaware finally to uh, give, give his father-in-law a judgeship and he would vote for uh, Jefferson. So who else came close? Um, uh, later had, on. Yeah, you, yeah, you mentioned well, Henry Clay, you mentioned Williams Jennings Bryan, Thomas Dewey. Why do we have to know these stories? These stories? Because, because if somebody like Henry Clay and William Jennings Bryan, who aren't barely in any high school history book, ran three times in major parties and lost. Somebody had to like them. You know, same thing with Dewey. He ran twice. Uh, uh, Hadley Stevenson ran twice and lost. These are all significant people of their time period. And uh, they were, uh, I mean, they, they, there were some interesting stories and some not, but basically they, they represented it. A great amount of people. Now, as much as 
uh, people can hate Donald Trump. I mean, he did run twice, you know, for president. And, uh, you know, as he says, I got 74 million votes or whatever the number he, he got. It's the truth. I mean, some people liked him. So he'll, you know, I, I do view him 50 years from now as being Martin Van Buren, you know, some, you know, insignificant president. But I could be wrong, but but that's the way I, I would see it. Uh, but, uh, but when you start looking at the history and the time period, you know, he's certainly a significant uh, figure now. And, and Clay, you know, really almost became president. I mean, really came close three times. And, and Brian, not so much, but you know, he ran three times. People wanted to put him up for president three different times. Dewey got really close. Yes, of course. Dewey got really, Dewey, he was on the Dewey. newspaper. Yeah, he was, he was declared the winner. Dream. There it is, hey. Uh, why is it important that we know those stories, that we understand that history can turn on a dime like that? Well, uh, you know, you're, you are, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a historical term called the fallacy of the immediacy. And it, it is that uh, you're living now, and it's very hard to not be living now and have that uh, uh, sound going through your ears. Oh, like a telephone? Did, did you plan yeah, that? I mean, that's a, that's a, yeah, 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 right, exactly. Uh, that, that's uh, Marshall McLuhan coming out. Anyway, so, so the, um, the uh, yeah, I can't turn it off, unfortunately. It's a, it's a it, but it's okay. people will say, it's probably a, uh, uh, a call asking me to contribute to, uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, John Marshall's campaign John fund. Marshall's fund, right. Yeah. There is a fund for his robe. Uh, they, they're trying to restore his robe. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, it, it, it's just, uh, it, it, it's like uh, people will say, well, that was the best World Series. And they'll say, since when, last year? I mean, you know, it's a, you, you, you forget about these things. And and uh, uh, the same thing about about history is it is that we forget about studying James Buchanan or you know my guy or or uh, or, uh, or John Marshall or, or or any of these people who who don't become Washington Lincoln you know maybe Roosevelt uh, uh, because we don't have time I mean it's a you know it's a continuum. When you take high school history or college history, you know, uh, uh, Columbus discovers America or he doesn't. And uh, uh, Washington leads the revolution. Lincoln frees the slaves. Roosevelt deals with the Depression, World War II. Now it's May and we haven't even got the Kennedy yet, you know. And we've only seen little slices. I mean, as with one of my, uh, I, 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 I've been helping students at, at Carleton College of Minnesota, where I went, in Davidson, where my, my kids went. Uh, replace their uh, uh, internships that they lost and made up made up courses. And one of the girls is, has gone along with me, and we we do a, a thing called stand up history. It's not it's it's not a podcast that, that I care about selling. I mean, we just wanted to do it, and so it's fun things in history, you know. And uh, uh, you, know, you, you, you know, one of them is the eighteen fifty six election. Now, you know, who cares, right? But when I go out and talk about Buchanan, that's what I talk about. I talk about how this election was really uh, what led to the Civil War. Uh, and, but it also led to the beginning of the Republican Party and, and uh, in a certain sense, set a long modern history as it goes in the last uh, century and a half after that. So, you know, for me, it's fun to go look at these things and look at the goofy people and the sinister people and the good people. and and, and uh, you know, you got to remember, that, like, I used to work at a TV station uh, adjacent to, uh, it was on Independence Mall. And I'd come out at night after producing the news and the glimmer of the lights are there. And I can see the shadows of Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin arm in arm. And there's Caesar Rodney from Delaware across the park. And they say, Caesar, great party last night. You know, we'll be over tomorrow. You know, well, what were they doing? Wouldn't you like? Wouldn't you, you like to be in the White House when uh, when Obama says to Malia, "You're not going out with that guy Tommy anymore," you know, or or George Bush comes up to his parents' house in in uh, in uh, Maine and he's out fishing and he comes in and he puts his they're watching television. He puts his feet up on the uh, on the uh, coffee table and Mrs. Bush whacks them off and says, "I don't care if you are president. No feet on my 
coffee table. You know, so that's, that's sort of the history that I imagine uh, goes on. You know, there's a, there's a story that Aaron Burr set up uh, James Madison and Dolly Madison. I won't get into it, but he probably did, you know, because the was it, filled up real small and they were, you know, the beautiful widow coming by. How does today's Supreme Court reflect John Marshall? There are all kinds of interesting cases we could talk about. I mean, there's Roe v. Wade that's constantly in, you know, bandied about. There's Bush v. Gore, Citizens United, Obamacare, the D.C. gun ruling. Um, which modern cases speak to Marshall's theory? Well, I would say this, that they, 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 the cases that come up, you know, Roe v. Wade, if you look at the, uh, uh, the actual facts of it, like I said, it's not like different than Marbury versus Madison. They've chosen, you know, the, the, the thing, the, 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 the cases that get sent up to them, uh, uh, often I would say the Supreme Court Chief Justice chooses certain cases because he knows it's going to prove a point. Uh, I would also say that uh, Roberts, like Marshall, I, I believe, not that I know him, but in recent votes and, and recent talks, he does not want to be on the wrong side of history. Uh, that's why I don't think an actual Roe v. Wade case will ever make it to the Supreme Court. They'll nip at all this stuff and the states, I mean, essentially Roe v. Wade has been overturned because of the states that have done what they've done uh, and provided women's services for abortion. But, uh, but he doesn't want to rule on that itself. The same way I don't think there's going to be a gay marriage case coming before the Supreme Court. That's passed for them. So what I see of the Supreme Court taking on, they still want to be this, uh, I don't know, godlike power. You know, we can turn down anything. And uh, it's, not that, it's not that they're conservative or liberal in that sense, but they are jurists. I mean, the other day, Clarence Thomas came up with, with, with something about selling marijuana. Oh my God! You know Clarence Thomas. You know, so so they they can, uh, you know, they they can speak. They know that they can say whatever they want. <laughs> Must be nice. Did Marshall realize what impact he'd had before he died? Oh yeah, because he was thirty four years there. He he uh, he tried to he tried to keep together this idea of having one voice until the very end, when of course all the other justices were. Uh, Republican uh, uh, or Jacksonian or Jeffersonian justices, uh, he 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 felt that he was able to at least, even if he even if the uh, the, the suits might have been going against him, or uh, he felt that he was keeping up the honor of the court, and that uh, the court, after he left it, whether he resigned or died, uh, was going to uh, was going to keep these standards that that he set. Did he understand that Marbury v. Madison would be the, basically the basis for all constitutional law? Well, probably not when he decided it. He needed it to be the basis for, you know, 1803 or whenever it was mm -hmm. decided. Uh, uh, he, needed it, he needed it to be, uh, well, you know, I mean, he, he viewed Washington as the great uh, savior of the nation. Like I said, he wrote this uh, uh, long and, and uh, uh, arduous biography of him through his papers. But uh, one of the things he understood about Washington is Washington decided what the executive was going to be like. And I think that Marshall's whole idea is that I'm going to decide how the judiciary is going to be. Where it, where it wasn't at the exact beginning, but it was sort of where he picked it up. And uh, uh, so, and essentially you have Hamilton and Madison deciding what Congress is going to be like. Not quite in the same way, but Washington definitely, without writing the rules, did the rules. You know, he, he, he was a little less formal. He decided not to be king. You know, he, he, uh, he wanted different voices in the cabinet. He was able to uh, 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 adjudicate many of their issues. Uh, not everybody loved Washington, but most people respected him. You and I first met each other five, six years ago now. You wrote a book called Worst president ever with periods in between each of them. Your book was yeah. about James Buchanan, who was our 15th president and who served from 1856 to 1860. 
or I guess 1857 to 1861. And um, the book is essentially about someone who, I don't want to say no legacy, but someone who has a legacy that most presidential historians find to be, uh, frankly, terrible. Why did you go from writing about the worst president ever to someone who left this um, essentially glowing legacy in our judicial process? Well, I, I also feel that you can learn through failure. You know, it's like uh, I, I would say that to, I would tell people that, you know, in all the, 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 the new survey has come out. You know, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of the new, uh, is now C-SPAN runs the survey of presidents and by God, Buchanan is still last. So anyway, uh, but the top three are, uh, as they always are, uh, Lincoln, Washington and Roosevelt. And so if you tell a new president what to read about, well, you can tell him to read about Washington, but it's not likely you're going to found the country. You can tell about, read about Lincoln, it's not likely you're going to free the slaves and have a civil war. And Roosevelt, also not likely to have a world war and solve the depression. But who do you go to next? James Monroe, pretty good president. But, you know, that's like uh, writing a, a, a biography of the third best guy on your favorite football team. You know, it's not likely to, to sell a lot of books. But if you go to failure and say, this is what I don't want to be like. And, uh, you know, say, I've been able to promote that. And, and, and still, <laughs> you can still buy the book. And, and, and I'll, uh, I, I did get a call from the New York Times a couple of months ago to defend uh, uh, Buchanan as the worst president. And I sort of said some sort of funny things like he was really was like the best party giver in, in, in 19th century America, you know, so people liked him, but he was just a bad president. And uh, so early in the story, all the other famous historians, Sean Watts from Princeton and Doris Prince Goodwin are giving this reasons why Trump is the worst president, very serious. At the end, the woman puts my, my comment in. So that's how I would like to be seen as sort of the, sort of the, uh, the guy leavening things. And, you know, uh, we were able I mean, he's sort of the second most uh, significant president because he really did cause the Civil War. All, there were presidents just before him. The Civil War could have started under their watch. But uh, no, it happened on his. And he did many things, including uh, pretty much uh, uh, influencing the Dred Scott decision to, to start it off. But, but uh, without getting into all those things. Well, what just, a legacy he left. Um, oh, what, why, why did he? But why did you go from someone with that yes, legacy okay. to this right, major to legacy? Somebody good? Well, because I was looking for something else in American history. You know, like uh, uh, even casual people, people you know, know Hamilton, right? You know, now through the musical, uh, uh, it's a wonderful thing. And so when I discovered that Marshall, it wasn't just the picture of the guy with the uh, poofy shirt, you know, and uh, and uh, the, you know the hair in the portrait uh, that he really was a, 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 a guy who moved up and down the ladder to get to his point I thought this is another way of talking about history it's not it's not it's not so much that it's this guy but it's the way history was for us in the beginning of the country uh, am I allowed to talk we, Robert and I have met each other we've had a nice long coffee together so I, I he's told me some uh, some of his book ideas. I'm wondering if I'm allowed to say one of them, which I thought oh, was yeah, great. Sure, sure, Is that sure. all right? I don't want someone to steal it, but uh, you once told me you wanted to write a book about blue things in red states and red things in blue states. Um, is that some? Is that in the offing, or um, that's a general way of asking what's next? Okay. Well, uh, I'm pretty pretty sure. I I just have to. Uh, I gave my. Uh, uh, Asian three ideas, and they were all American history because you know, a fourth one wasn't. It was about I've traveled to 105 countries, and I thought I could write the nerdy guys uh, 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 eat, pray, love. But he said, "I'm sure you have some good stories, but I'm not going to represent that book." You know, it's like so. So the other three are all American history, and one, the one I like the best, although it's not the one my wife likes the best. One I like the best is the founding fathers of the Confederacy. And uh, it does have a, you know, obviously as a modern uh, uh, reason to do it. But I just found, my God, no matter what you think of this country, they, like from South Carolina seceding to founding a country was a few months, right? 
And, and the country lasted for four years and was able to uh, uh, amass a big army. So uh, how did they do it? And uh, who were these guys? I mean, I can tell you one is Jeff Jefferson Davis is an amazing character. Jefferson Davis could have been the candidate instead of Buchanan in 1856. So imagine what a different kind of country it would have been. He was a secretary of war under Pierce. He was sort of the, you know, the Dick Cheney to George Bush. He was the horse whisperer to, to Franklin Pierce. And uh, uh, I don't know why, but he didn't challenge. I guess he still wanted to be in Congress, go back to the Senate. But of course, uh, you writing that book um, is not an endorsement of what the Confederacy would say. Oh, no, 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 Of course no. not. Okay. No, I just not, want, to, not, not I want to give you a chance to say that. And all that sort of stuff. But you, you could say that, uh, you know, Lincoln's the worst president. Why didn't he just let them go off? What did we need these slave states for? You know, I, I mean, it, you know, it's one way to capture it. Now, of course, we didn't want slavery to continue, in, in, even if it wasn't our country. But uh, 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 there's a uh, there's a case to be made that that at the beginning of the country it was it was bifurcated. You know, like I said, Virginia. We we went we've gone. You know, it's funny we've gone from a Virginia centric country to a New York centric country to now a California centric country, without you know without the we you know you know we view what comes out of California as like what's next, and 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 certainly in the early days that what was next about Virginia and that's in a sense what's kept the country together in the beginning instead of fraying into two or more different countries. So we could have had the civil war without having the civil war, without having a war uh, early on. Robert Strauss, the author of John Marshall, Final Founder. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I love it. Good seeing you. Great to see you. Check out that book and his Twitter feed, which is at R.S. Strauss. I want to invite listeners to our Patreon page to ask for your support in keeping the show going. Go to patreon.com slash History. We will donate part of your contributions to a charity for children's literacy. Thank you for listening to Axelbank Reports, History, and Today, conversations with America's top nonfiction authors and why their books matter right now. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Axelbank History. We update those with clips from the show guest announcements, and book recommendations. See you next time. Thanks.